Hello and welcome to Sense and Sensibility, the Inflation Guy podcast. I am Michael Ashton. I am the Inflation Guy and I am your host. Today on the podcast, a deep breath, deep breath. This is the 100th episode of Sense and Sensibility. Yes, I know that people who do daily podcasts are in the thousands and what have you, but but for our podcast, you know, 100 episodes is is a meaningful amount. So today's episode, I'm going to look back a little bit, look forward a little bit. It'll be a fairly short episode, I think. Uh, But before we get into it, a word from our sponsors. This episode of Sense and Sensibility is sponsored by Simplify ETFs, a fast-growing manager of alternative ETFs solving today's most pressing portfolio challenges. Not only do they have sophisticated diversifying strategies like a managed futures ETF or a yield curve play like TUA, they also have the number one best-performing intermediate core bond fund from last year. Uh, That's AGGH, and they have an enhanced income ETF, ticker HIGH, that was in the top 2% of its category. Check out their website at simplify.us. That's simplify.us, and you can find their entire lineup of ETFs at simplify.us slash ETFs. And, of course, we're, we're also sponsored by Enduring Investments. Imagine if you could be a hedge fund investor or a pension or wealth management CIO 35 years ago instead of 2024. With all of the inefficiencies that were around back then and before they were squeezed out by you know, high frequency trading and fast moving opportunistic asset allocation models. There was a, a, a an opportunity set for alpha that was rich and persistent. It's still around. It's still around, but it's in inflation linked and inflation adjacent instruments. If you're going to exploit those opportunities today, you need someone who exists on the cutting edge, the cutting frontier of understanding that market. You don't want to assail Everest without a Sherpa. Enduring Investments is your inflation Sherpa. Visit EnduringInvestments.com. And in fact, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is what Enduring Investments kind of is all about. 100 episodes. When I started in, and I'm not going to get maudlin in any of this, but when I started this episode, this podcast in August 2021, there was a There was a a podcaster, uh, Stuart Foley, who runs the Inflation AUM podcast. And I'd been on the podcast a couple times, and and I said, you know, Stuart, you're really good at this. And he goes, oh, it's so easy. You should do a podcast. And I said, that's not that easy. It's really, really hard. And look at all the people out there who've done podcasts, but there's, you know, there's a lot of them, but there's not nearly as many as you would think if it was easy. And he goes, no, no, Mike, it's really easy. And he you know, told me basically how to do it and said I should do it. And so I started to do it. When I started it in August of 2021, I, I thought there was a 50-50 chance that I'd do maybe five or 10 and say, this is ridiculously hard uh, and quit. And in fact, the first episode that I did, and I didn't really know how to use the, you know, audio editing software. Um, and it took me just forever to edit it. And I said, this sucks. This is really hard. I, actually, nowadays, almost all of my podcasts, and you can probably tell, are very lightly edited, partly because I'm better at just yammering away, uh, and partly because I kind of know when something is going to need to be edited out, and I edit it out on the fly. <laughs> but but anyway, I, I thought there was a chance I would just do five or ten of these things. And then, and then you know, something like a thousand people started downloading the episodes, um, and, and I just kept going. And my second episode was about the diamond water paradox, and and But as inflation, inflation kept going up and up, there was a lot to talk about. And, of course, you didn't necessarily know that back in, in August of 21. I, obviously, I expected it, but uh, you never know. Um, and so every month, you know, I do the CPI summary after the CPI report. And, and in, it was in November of 2021, um, as core inflation hit a new high of 4.6% with median at 31 The title of my pod was, what did you think was going to happen? What did you think would happen? And uh, and that was sort of, you know, essentially me explaining why when you have lots and lots of money, this is not, it was not transitory. 
and and telling everybody right up front, this is not transitory. This is exactly what you would expect is going to happen. And people for the next year or two kept saying it was transitory. Um, I talked about the absurdity of negative interest rates. I've talked about gold, housing, commodities, crypto, tips, I bonds. A year ago, I talked about whether AI would kill inflation. Uh, I've talked about seasonal adjustment. I've talked about hedonic adjustment. I've talked about how to make an inflation index. I've talked about some dumb indices, uh, some dumb research. I've talked about good research in inflation. I've called the peak in inflation twice, in fact. I called it and then, and then I called it again when it went back up. And now 100 episodes later, median inflation is still 2.2% higher than when I started. Core is about the same, actually, but but at least it's coming down. Will it take another 100 episodes for median inflation to be back to where I started? And And what will I talk about once it gets there? Of course, my view is that the days of, of low levels of inflation and, more importantly, low volatility of inflation are over. And so I suspect there will be plenty to talk about. But even if inflation goes back to where it was, we're still going to be talking about risk because risk is always there. And now people know about this risk. And, of course, that's part of my theme. Part of my theme is, you know, this is inflation hedging and being aware and, and being an inflation aware investor is not a sometimes thing. It is not a tactical thing that you do. It is a strategic, it's a way of looking at your risks. And even if that risk is not something you think is really likely to happen, if if it's really easy to hedge against or very cheap to hedge against, then even if it's not very likely, it's still something you should do. And that's, I think, the problem that people misunderstand about hedging as an aside here that, you know, if if you have a, a tail risk hedge, and it, it recently has been the news, Bloomberg had a story about a bunch of tail risk hedges that you know haven't worked out well because the stock market's gone up and up and up. And and that's not really the problem with the tail risk hedge. If the tail risk doesn't happen, then you don't make money. The problem is that if you are systematically paying a lot of money for the tail risk, uh, then you you know then you you kind of will gradually lose money over time. What's interesting about inflation is that a lot of times these tail risks are hedgeable with for you know that in ways that just don't cost you very much money. So even if you're wrong, even if inflation stays low, it just doesn't cost you very much. You know, being long commodities when inflation is low, but interest rates are high so that that your uh, your collateral return is high is is a very cheap way to get inflation protection. Because worst case is you get a 5% collateral return. And and if you get inflation, then you get this big spike. And there's no really good reason to think that commodities will necessarily just go down and down and down and down and down if there's no in inflation. So, you know, but there are, are – that's a, probably a bad example. But there are, there are lots of examples of ways that, that normal portfolios can get inflation protection for fairly inexpensively. But maybe, so that's what we'll talk about. If inflation goes back down, there'll still be plenty, I think, to talk about. Whether or not there'll be demand, whether or not anyone will want to hear about it is a totally different question, of course. But maybe it took this episode of inflation to provoke the tools that we need to deal with in future, to deal with future episodes of inflation. Maybe it took this episode of inflation to, to bring an awareness to bring people to this podcast, right? If I had done this podcast in 2016, I, it could have been the best podcast in the world. No one was going to tune into it. Um, there would always be some people who, you know, worry about it, but it wouldn't be a thousand people, you know, in the first month or so. Um, so, so I, th I think, you know, this spike in inflation, if nothing else, and it was, it was an unnecessary spike in inflation, but it has done something positive, and that is to raise the awareness of this particular risk. And it might be what was needed to catapult the development of inflation hedging going forward. 20 years ago, and it literally was just over 20 years ago, it was the end of, of January in uh, 2004, I spoke at the Barclays Inflation Conference in Key Biscayne, Florida. And it was a big conference. Um, back then, hundreds of people there, and and I gave a presentation. 
about the new inflation futures that that were were just launching, inflation swaps that had, you know, had just been just started trading the inner dealer uh, broker market, and all the cool things we were going to be able to do soon. You know, that we were finally having this development, we were moving on from just tips, and we were going to be able to do all this other really, really neat stuff, and it was going to happen soon. Almost none of it actually happened or has happened yet. And in fact, CPI futures, which was one of the reasons I was giving this this presentation, is because we were I was the sole market maker of the CPI futures at the time, um, and, and it had been my idea uh, to go and launch these things. They were delisted after a couple of years, delisted. But now there are signs, and I've spoken about some of them recently, um, that that we are, you know, there are some uh, developments, there are some tools that are, are are moving forward. And I want to update one of those discussions for this podcast and so, because we're looking forward here. And, and this was a fairly recent thing. Two episodes ago, I, I mused about whether or not you'll be able to trade medical care inflation soon. And... And I mentioned that a company called IMX Health just recently got approved as a designated contract market, DCM, um, which means that they could launch futures on healthcare or, for that matter, anything else they want to launch futures on. And instead, their first contract was announced to be a contract on a Morningstar index of medical care stocks. And and in the episode, I I mentioned that I was pretty discouraged by that because as their their website um, talks about, you know, hedging healthcare and and using stocks is not the way to hedge healthcare. So here's the update, though. I spoke to the founders of IMX Health. You know, one of the nice things about being the inflation guy is that when something happens in inflation space that's interesting, everybody like emails me and people put me in contact with folks and, and whatever. But I, I spoke to the founders of IMX Health, some very delightful people, and I'm and I'm. Very pleased to report that they they don't intend for the new exchange to just be another way to trade stonks. Um, I introduced them to my to my podcast, and they listened to the podcast, and and we had a nice conversation that where they were at pains to tell me that that's not you know that that's not where they intend to go. They tell me they have access to low latency, high resolution claims data on a very large number of Americans, anonymized, obviously. They don't know exactly, you know, about the heart transplant you're waiting for or anything like that. But but they have claims data that in principle allows them, you know, and it's it's uh, has the the resolution down to individual diagnosis codes and and treatment codes and so on. In principle that allows them to separate actually utilization measures, like how many MRIs, how many knee MRIs per 100,000 people, and price measures, how much does a knee MRI cost, which are both, both of those parts, utilization and price, are both part of medical care inflation and medical care cost and medical care inflation from the standpoint of an insurance company, right? So if I write a policy for long-term care, I'm interested in two things, both what does the what does it cost for a given standard of care, but also how much more care are people going to consume over time? And the, the people at IMX Health have the data that would allow them to create futures to trade the two things together, but more importantly, to be able to separate them so you could trade the utilization question separately from the price question. And they, more importantly, they understand what they have and they understand that it's a really, really important thing. Um, and and the ability to do that is very important to insurers, self-insurers, reinsurers, and they haven't been separately, they haven't been tradable before, and they haven't been separately hedgeable before. In fact, I talked about that issue um, in episode 97 about inflation and reinsurance and the idea about having a price and inflation, a medical care inflation uh, uh, adjustment. So so that your your reinsurance treaty was just on the quantity part, um, on the utilization part, because you separately hedged the price part. Well, this kind of goes one further and allows you to trade both both of those parts separately. 
importantly, the founders of IMX Health seem exquisitely aware of the union. And by the way, I, I, I should st- I'm going to stop here for a second. IMX Health has paid me nothing. Um, I this is this is not a they're not a sponsor of the podcast. Um, you know, I I hope that they will uh, uh, want some help on these things, but um, but this uh, but I I I want to make sure this is. Even if it sounds sometimes like an infomercial, it's this is not an infomercial. They they in the conversation I had with them, they seem exquisitely aware that of the uniqueness of what they have and what they could create, which was my concern that you know, you go out and you created, you know, a futures contract on an index of stocks and it does not show that you appreciate the uniqueness of your position. Um, I do think they could use some help in structuring the offerings, but they are thinking about this the right way. And and by that, what I mean is, it's they're thinking about this the way the the Chicago Mercantile Exchange used to think about listing contracts. When we first listed the CPI futures contract back in in uh, February of '04, I had gone to them in the summer of uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the summer of '03 and said we should launch. You know, we've got these inflation swaps that are going to start trading, and we should have futures. And and here's what they should be structured like. And it was a dumb structure, and I've talked about this before. But um, and they said, sure, no problem. It's easy to go ahead and list a contract. We'll just go and you know go around and talk to people. We'll list it and we'll see what happens. And and that was their attitude back then. It's like it costs us nothing to go and list a contract, and if nobody shows up, no big deal. We'll delist it. And the CME no longer thinks about about it that way. Um, there's a big hurdle for them to go and list something. And I don't fully understand why. Um, but IMX Health, um, and I think also Kalshi, by the way, who is not quite at the same place and they're not in the same niche, obviously, as IMX Health. But they, you know, similarly, I think they, they recognize the same thing, which is that, hey, you know, it is very, very cheap to go and list some contracts and see what happens. F around and find out. You know, is the, uh, uh, the common phrase these days. Days, it, it, you don't have to have the perfect contract to list it and and just see what happens. Um, and in fact, I think that's how IMX is thinking about their first contract on stocks. You know, what's the worst that can happen? There's nothing. No one trades it, right? But let's get it out there and let's let's you know something that has easy mechanics and let's you know see if we can you know get that to work and then we'll move to the more complex stuff. Um, you know, in a way, I think that if that first contract doesn't do well, it'll, it might be good because it'll help them to focus on, on the really unique stuff, but I do want them to succeed. So 20 years after my Key Biscayne speech and 21 years after the first U.S. CPI swaps traded in the interdealer broker market, uh, maybe my slide about the future of inflation derivatives can actually finally move forward. Uh, I'd predicted back then another try at tips futures and and various sorts of options, including inflation swaptions, which don't exist, options on tips, which don't exist, they don't really exist, um, and options on futures, which, since futures don't exist, don't exist. I mentioned in the presentation, I mentioned callable corporate inflation bonds, and I'm used about perpetual inflation-linked bonds or you know, inflation-linked preferred stocks, that sort of thing, inflation-linked consoles. Um, and of course, I talked about inflation subcomponents. I'm actually getting a head start on the latter, just in case, just in case you know, this is all moving forward. I've created a Google Sheet where you can see my hypothetical, at least for now, markets on various inflation subcomponents. There's a link in the show notes. If you're interested, you can ask me for, you know, hypothetical term sheets on the exact structure, but you can you can see the link in the show notes and you go look at what my markets are for, you know, 10-year medical care inflation where I think that that would trade. Um, and if you disagree and you want to trade some, then let me know. We, maybe we can get a two-sided market going. Um, anyway, I think that Kalashi is also going to have futures on, on you know, some of these things for what it's worth. Now, before I get too excited about the future, you know, we have to remember that we're still not doing some of the very simple things uh, very much. So I wanted to do 
an episode on creating an inflation-linked annuity, but there's really not enough there for for an episode because, you know, it, it's a really, really simple thing to do. Um, an inflation-linked annuity would be an annuity where the payments are an equal real amounts adjusted for inflation. So it's a hundred dollars, hundred of today's dollars, but going forward, that's going to be more dollars in the future, right? So, um, uh, it's it's a trivially easy thing to do, and yet they're almost unheard of. Um. There have been occasional offerings from insurance companies like John Hancock or TIAA, but they're few and far between, and I'm not aware of anyone currently offering them. It might be because it's you know, so easy to sculpt a tips ladder that does the same thing if you know what you're doing, but it also means it's an easy hedge for an insurance company to offer. Inflation-linked life annuities would be the ultimate retirement account because you couldn't run out of money because it's an annuity. It's a life annuity, right? And it's, um, you know, and it also protects you against inflation. So you can't run out of money and you can't have inflation take away what that money will buy. For that matter, it would be the ultimate measure of sufficiency of a retirement account. So, you know, the question in your retirement account isn't how many dollars do you have? It's what stream of real income can I buy that will last me for the rest of my life in an annuity? You know, is it $1,000 a month? Is it $10,000 a month in real terms for the rest of my life? Okay, that's, I should be able to look at the the balance in an account and say, here's how much of an annuity you could buy today with that with that amount of money. Um, that's honestly what, that's what your robo-investing software ought to be telling you, except that you can't actually buy such an annuity. Um and yet it's so, so easy to go do. But as I said, 100 episodes ago, I didn't know that Calshi was going to be interested in inflation futures, and I didn't know anything about IMX Health. And without the inflation of the last few years, there's a decent chance that we wouldn't be this much closer to the threshold of having a, a truly useful inflation market. And I wouldn't be on the threshold of doing my 101st podcast episode. Hopefully, I'll still be doing these podcasts when we get to a truly useful inflation market, because hopefully it won't be that long. But that's all for today. Thank you for being with me for 100 episodes. Um, that's all for this 100th podcast. Please like, subscribe, refer others. Contact me at inflationguy at enduringinvestments.com. You can go to the blog and subscribe for free at inflationguy.blog or follow me on X at inflation underscore guy. Of course, visit our sponsors. Visit Simplify and visit Enduring Investments if you have an inflation challenge. And most importantly, I've said it 100 times, defend your money. And if inflation is coming for you, remember, you know a guy.